G'day folks and welcome back to another pre-lecture snapshot for 1022. Well, this is the first of the semester, but if you did the Chem 1011 unit with us, you know how this works. Just a recap though, uh, and an introduction for those who are new to the unit. The way we go through the content in this unit is you watch a pre-lecture video, you do a pre-lecture quiz, and all of that closes before you cover that content in lectures. That's right, there is some expectation that you guys know a little bit about what's coming up in the next lecture. After you attend the lectures, you digest the content, and then you follow up with a post-lecture test. The quiz and the test are both in the Moodle website. The quizzes tend to be pretty easy. The test's a little bit more challenging to see how much of the material you've understood. Throughout the semester, there are four of these cycles. This first snapshot actually relates to weeks two and three of, uh, of semester. So in week two, we're going to talk about nucleophiles and electrophiles, a couple of bits of terminology you may not have heard before. And these two entities are kind of tied together with what we call curly arrows. It sounds like a cute little name, but that's really what we call them. And really the way that nucleophiles and electrophiles interact uh, via curly arrows which depict the movement of electrons, is really the story of making and breaking chemical bonds. Then we'll talk about some reaction types. So let's introduce these so-called nucleophiles and electrophiles. Here, this uh, element, which we're just calling B for the time being, notice it's got a lone pair and it's got a negative charge. This is our nucleophile. And let me introduce A. It's a cation, as you can see. It's got a positive charge. And this is our electrophile. And perhaps you can see where those names come from. The nucleophile has that spare pair of electrons. And it has a nominal negative charge on it. A curly arrow depicts the movement of these electrons. And in this case, that pair of electrons on the nucleophile is moving towards the electrophile. Actually, what those two electrons are going to do is form a new bond between A and B. In other words, we've just made a new chemical bond. We'll look at that in the upcoming slides. Week three of semester talks about, well, we give this topic the nickname of chemical detectives. It's really the act of taking little bits and pieces of information from different techniques to solve puzzles relating to molecular structure. When it comes to organic molecules, how do you know, as a researcher or a scientist, that you have the molecule you think you have. The way that we do that is we use techniques such as mass spectrometry, infrared spectroscopy, and NMR spectroscopy, which give us little clues about the molecular structure. How many carbon atoms? How many hydrogen atoms? What are the functional groups? What is the mass, the molecular mass of the molecule? And we can piece all of this together to put the puzzle, um, the puzzle of molecular structure back together. Let's start by talking about breaking bonds. And in this case here, you can see that we have A and B, and they're two parts of a molecule, and they're joined by a sigma bond. That's what that pair of electrons is doing there. There's two ways that we can break this bond. The first is that we might see those two electrons uh, go one toward the A and one towards the B component. We call this homolytic bond cleavage. You end up with neutral products uh, and with an unpaired electron radical on each of A and B. <clears throat> we use curly arrows, single-headed curly arrows, to indicate this movement of electrons. The other possibility, of course, is that both of those electrons favour one of the species over the other. In this case, we can see that both of the electrons have moved towards B, and that leaves A as a cation and B as an anion. You can see in this case the curly arrow is a double-headed curly arrow. Have a close look at these arrows and see if you can distinguish the difference. We often refer to these as a fish hook arrow or a normal arrow. And they represent the movement of one electron or two electrons at a time. When we're making bonds, we can use them the other way around. In this case, we see two radicals coming together with fish hook arrows to create a sigma bond. In this case, the two electrons they come from one of the entities, in this case B, which was our nucleophile. And those two electrons move towards the electrophile. In using curved arrows, there are two common types of electron redistribution. From a bond 
to an adjacent atom or from an atom to an adjacent bond. In other words, folks, the making and breaking of bonds. Probably the most common one that you're going to see throughout this semester is heterogenic bond formation, also known as polar reactions, where electrons go from an electron-rich atom to an electron-poor atom. So one of the key skills for you is going to be knowing how to identify what is a nucleophile and what is an electrophile. You can see where these names come from. A nucleophile is an electron-rich atom. It likes nuclei. Nuclei are positively charged, so it's a nucleophile. In contrast, an electrophile is an electron-poor atom. It likes electrons. That's where it gets the name electrophile. And an example might be a proton. In week two, you're going to be exploring some important reactions throughout organic chemistry. You'll look at addition, substitution, some oxidation and reduction reactions as well. Let's just kickstart the conversation with the addition to alkenes. And in this case here, we've got the molecule propene, and it reacts with hydrochloric acid. One of the interesting things about this reaction is, theoretically, there are two possible products. The hydrogen chloride molecule basically splits into two, and the hydrogen bonds to one of the carbons, and the chlorine atom bonds to uh, a different carbon on the molecule, the two carbons involved in the double bond. You can see the two possible products have the names there, two chloropropane and one chloropropane. And it just so happens that one chloropropane is never observed for this reaction. So I guess the question is, what is it about, for example, that chlorine atom that makes it want to bond to the carbon in the middle of the chain rather than the carbon at the end of the chain? And this defines Markovnikov's rule. In the addition of HX, and HX might be hydrogen chloride, it might be hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen bromide, or perhaps water to an alkane, hydrogen adds to the carbon of the double bond having the greater number of hydrogens. And in this case here you can see that the hydrogen has added to the carbon which had two hydrogens rather than one. Here are our two possible pathways. You can see that the upper pathway gives us one chloropropane and the bottom pathway gives us two chloropropane. Most importantly, I've included an intermediate species. This is our so-called carbocation. And I hope you can see where the name comes from. There's a cation sitting on one of the carbon atoms. In other words, this is a two-step process. If we go back to the beginning, you can see a curly arrow coming from the double bond towards a proton or towards a hydrogen atom. So the first bond that you make in this reaction is a new carbon to hydrogen bond. The second step of the reaction is where a chlorine atom then nucleophilically attacks that carbocation to form a new carbon-chlorine bond. So this could go one of two ways, if you like the high road or the low road. And as we saw on a previous slide, it's actually the low road, the formation of 2-chloropropane, which is the preferred product in this case here. This actually comes down to the relative stability of different carbocations. In this image here, you can see that we have three very similar looking species, but they're slightly different. What we actually have is a so-called primary carbocation, where the carbocation is attached to just one other carbon. Alternatively, we could have a secondary carbocation or a tertiary carbocation, where the number really relates to how many other carbon atoms are attached to our carbocation. Why is this important? Because as you go from primary to, to secondary to tertiary, you increase the stability of those carbocations. In other words, in this case, it's the tertiary carbocation which is most stable. Now, remember, this is your intermediate for the Markovnikov reaction. And so the most stable carbocation is going to be the one that is favoured for the reaction. Here's our reaction again. You can see that the high road, if you like, leading to one chloropropane, has a primary carbocation, while the high road has a secondary carbocation. Secondary is more stable than a primary carbocation, and that's why that pathway is preferred. That's enough for reactivity for the time being, and let's have a quick chat 
about chemical detectives. And it's the little nickname that we like to give to this process of using different analytical techniques for identifying what sorts of atoms and what sort of molecules you might have in the laboratory. <clears throat> the three listed here in green, mass spec, infrared and nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy or NMR spectroscopy, are the three most common that we like to use for organic chemistry. In first semester you might remember using techniques such as AAS or UV-Vis spectroscopy for quantitative techniques. These sorts of activities are really like a puzzle. It's a bit like solving a brain teaser where you get a little bit of information from each of those techniques and you have to piece them together to come up with the identity of your molecule. Mass spectrometry is the first one. Electron impact ionization mass spec is routinely used to determine the molecular weight of a compound. In other words, working out the molecular mass. Infrared spectroscopy is a different technique. It really gives us a spectral fingerprint. And much like human beings, molecules have their own unique fingerprint, in this case a spectral fingerprint. The graph that you can see on this page is known as the infrared spectrum. Each of those um, downward peaks that you can see in that spectrum, they represent a part of the molecule vibrating. And each of those peaks will be in a slightly different position depending on the molecular structure. And so you can see that different molecules will have a slightly different spectrum. In other words, a kind of spectral fingerprint. There's a very nice animation, if you follow the link at the bottom of this slide, which tells you a lot more about the background behind infrared spectroscopy. I recommend you go and have a look at that in your own time. But here are some of the characteristic band positions, which will tell you a lot about what sort of molecule you've got. You can see that an OH functionality, such as in an alcohol or a carboxylic acid, gives you a broad band in the region 3200 to 3600 wave number. <clears throat> Amines also have broad bands in this region. Your CH stretching vibration, typically around 3000 wave number, and some of those other modes listed as you can see there. It's really the carbonyl stretch and the OH stretch modes which give away a lot about molecules. For the two molecules you can see here, propen-2-ol and propen-1-ol, they're very similar molecules, in fact they're constitutional isomers. But you can see that there are very distinct differences between their infrared spectra. Molecules which have a carbonyl stretch give rise to a strong absorption around 1700 wave number. The exact frequency depends on the strength of the bond. And we can see that manifesting in a different way for esters to aldehydes to ketones. The third one I'd like to talk about is NMR spectroscopy. It's a powerful technique perhaps the favourite of the organic chemists, that gives three different types of information. It tells you what sort of functional groups you have in your molecule. It tells you the number of different chemical environments, but it also tells you the connectivity of different groups inside your molecule. Occasionally, NMR spectroscopy alone can be unambiguously used to tell you the molecular structure. But more often than not, you need to combine it with mass spec and infrared spectroscopy data. Once again, there's a really nice animation that I encourage you to look at at the bottom of the screen here. In short, NMR spectroscopy gives you information about that spectral fingerprint, a little bit like infrared spectroscopy. But it has a different scale and it actually involves uh, radiation from the electromagnetic spectrum at much lower frequency. However, for different functional groups, and you can see here we're distinguishing between alkanes, alkenes, uh, alkyl halides, uh, and aromatic species, you will get peaks in the spectrum in different regions depending on the functional group in the molecule. Here's an example of an NMR spectrum. The integration that you can see, which is, the, if you like, the height of the peak, or more correctly, it's actually the area under each of these very narrow peaks, is proportional to the equivalent number of hydrogens. If we look at the molecule I've shown you here, it's an ester. We actually have three protons on the left-hand side, which are in a unique chemical environment. 
On the right-hand side of that molecule, there are another nine protons, three in each of those CH3 groups. And we would say that all nine of those protons are in an equivalent environment. The atoms that they're all connected to are exactly the same. We can see this manifesting in the spectrum by the different heights in the peaks, or most accurately, the area under those peaks. And you can see that the peak ratio is three to nine, corresponding to the three protons in one environment and the eight, sorry, the nine protons in the other environment. I won't go through these examples now, but here's a few practice problems for you to think about in your own time. Here's several more, and I've given you the answers in this case. Have a think about these molecules, and have a think about why the first one, for example, has two unique chemical environments for its protons. The first arrow is pointing to a CH2 group. The second arrow is pointing to a CH3 group. Why do you think we consider these two environments as being different? What about the other half of the molecule? Why don't we consider those to be a third and a fourth different chemical environment? And there are three more examples for you to think about yourself. That brings us to the end of this snapshot, and that was probably the quickest lecture I've ever given about spectroscopy. So there's a bit more to it, and I encourage you to look at some of those animations for a bit more background if you're still not sure. Now go ahead and try out the pre-lecture quiz, and good luck. Hopefully you can get 10 out of 10.